everybody. In this video, we're going to prove what I consider maybe the most important theorem in the entire course. So it says if we have a non-zero n-dimensional complex vector space, and complex is hugely important here, then for a linear operator t, we are guaranteed to have an eigenvalue. For a real operator, this isn't guaranteed, but complex, everything's going to work nicely. We're going to use that good old fundamental theorem of algebra to make it all work. All right, let's give it a try. Well, since we have a non-zero vector space, I can take a non-zero vector. So we'll let v be a non-zero vector in v. And what I want to do is start applying the operator t to v over and over and over again. And I'm going to do that until I build a list which is linearly dependent. Now, how do I know that I can find such a list? Well. Let's say I started with v, and I go tv, t squared v, t cubed v, and I keep going. Eventually, I'll get a list which has length n plus 1. And what's significant about n plus 1? Well, n was the dimension of the vector space. And we know that any list with length n plus 1 or greater is going to be linearly dependent, because we know you could extend any linearly independent list to a basis. And how could you extend an n plus 1 length list to an n length list? Not possible. All right, so I start with v, and I write down tv, and t squared v, and so forth, and I'll get to some spot, tkv, which will be the first time that my list is linearly dependent. All right. So this is linearly dependent, and if I went one less, so if I stopped it, k minus 1 applications of t, this would be a linearly deep independent list. Right. Okay, knowing that this is a linearly dependent list, and that this was not, tells me that tkv can be written as a linear combination of v through tk minus 1v. Right. If I have a linearly dependent list, the last term in the list can be written as a linear combination of the previous terms. So I would know that tkv could be written as some linear combination of this list below. All right, well, I want to use this to produce a polynomial. So let's write our, our polynomial over here. So first, if I subtracted everything to one side, I would end up having some essentially polynomial in T applied to V equals zero. Right? In fact, we'll, we'll do that right here. So this would say that uh, T to the K um, minus A K minus one, T to the K minus one minus, we'll go all the way down A one T minus A naught, and let me use the identity operator on V here. And if we apply this to V, so notice we get t to the kv and minus a k minus 1, t k minus 1 applied to v and so forth. This should equal 0. So I have a polynomial in t applied to v and that equals 0. All right, well, what's this polynomial? All right, well, over here, the polynomial we're getting is z to the k minus a k minus 1, z to the k minus 1 minus a 1 z minus a naught. And if this polynomial is going to equal, well, we don't even need it to equal zero. If you have this polynomial, mind you, this is a polynomial, and we're working over the complex numbers. So we can factor this. The fundamental theorem of algebra tells us we can factor this as a product of linear factors. So we could rewrite this as z minus, well, I'm just going to take here complex numbers, lambda 1, lambda 2. These are the roots of this polynomial. And how many will there be? Well, since this is a k-degree polynomial, we'll end up with k of these roots. All right, well, if this polynomial can be factored, then, okay, well, it is. We can, instead of applying this polynomial to the operator, we could apply this product of linear polynomials to the operator. And so if I did that, I would get, oh, we're missing one thing here. Uh, no, actually, we're, uh, no, we're okay. Uh, okay, so if I factor this, 
what will I end up getting? So t minus lambda 1i dot 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 t minus lambda k i applied to v is equal to 0. All right, so I take this element v and I put it in to the first map. It spits out another vector. I put it into the second map. It spits out another vector. I put it into the third map. It spits out another vector. I keep doing this. And when I get out to the end, right, I put it into the last map, and zero comes out. So at some point, at some point it must have been zero for the first time. Could have been the last time. Could have been somewhere in the middle. Heck, it could have been the first time. I don't know. But at some point, one of these t minus lambda something times i's is going to spit out zero. And that tells me that there exists some vector in the null space of, well, one of these operators. I don't know which. So let's just call it t minus lambda i i. What does it mean to have a vector, and it's really a non-zero vector? So we say non-zero because we're starting with something non-zero. So we have some non-zero vector in the null space of t minus lambda i i. That means that we have an eigenvalue. Right? Lambda i is going to be an eigenvalue for t, if and only if there's a non-zero vector in the null space of t minus lambda i times the identity map. So this implies, and this is for some i. And so this implies lambda i is an eigenvalue of t. Okay? So this finishes the proof of maybe the most important theorem in our course.